Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Word of God for our consideration today are words of our second lesson. Um, it's a somewhat long lesson. I'm definitely not going to read the whole thing to you here now. But uh, the, these words of the book of Philemon, um, which we are perhaps not the most familiar with from the New Testament, um, fit also with the words that Jesus had to say in the gospel lesson with the ability to let go of all earthly claims to follow him. Uh, Philemon has to do that too. Uh, here uh, again uh, from Philemon, beginning at verse 7. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have no issue at Grace Lutheran Church with slavery, so far as I know. It uh, may still be a part of the social order in other parts of the world, but it has been illegal in the United States of America for almost 160 years now. That being the case, you could be forgiven if you wondered why in the world are we going to take this time in a sermon today to devote to a study of uh, Philemon and this issue of a Christian slave owner and a Christian slave from some 2,000 years ago. Both Christianity and the Bible are sometimes... criticized, they're brought under attack because uh, they, they don't seem to speak as clearly as people would like against the topic of slavery. But if we're going to be fair, we have to understand that the Bible and Christianity both did play an instrumental role, if not the key role, in the abolition movement in our own country so many years ago. And let's understand what the Bible says. In the Apostle Paul's first letter to Timothy, he includes slave traders together with those divine lawbreakers like murderers and adulterers and liars who come under God's judgment. In the Old Testament, there was no such thing as lifetime slavery unless a person actually chose it. But the Old Testament required that all slaves be set free every seven years. And frankly, it is really hard to try to make the idea of holding another person as a slave against their will line up with the general summary of God's commandments, love your neighbor as yourself. But you know, the early Christians did not go on protest marches to try to force their standard of morality on other people. They did not try to take over the government in order to reform society. In fact, they seem to have very little interest in changing society as a whole altogether. They changed individuals. They changed hearts. They, they did not compromise their biblical moral standards, nor were they afraid to speak about them to the other people around them, nor were they even going to keep their mouths shut about what the consequences might be for other people who rejected them eternally. But mostly they talked about Jesus. Mostly they directed people to God's grace and Jesus' love. They realized that any change that did not involve a sincere faith in their Savior from sin was no true change 
at all. What was the benefit if a person changed their outward lifestyle and yet did not follow the right Savior? But if a person trusted and followed Jesus as their true Savior, they understood it was only a matter of time before their life and behavior began to fall into line as well. This patient, loving, gospel-based approach to changing people's behavior is also very much in play in this letter from Paul to Philemon that we have before us today. And so while we may not have an issue with slavery per se, we certainly have something to learn from the Apostle Paul in a method that we can embrace and put into practice ourselves for encouragement, Christian encouragement, to do the right thing. And among other things, that Christian encouragement involves these four principles. Remember how you have changed. See how others have changed. Recognize the blessing in it all and consider your partners. Philemon was not the same man he had been before Paul met him. Philemon is a Greek name, and as such, we have no reason to assume anything other than that he grew up as a pagan. He was a Gentile, not one of God's people. We, we don't know a whole lot about his background, but that much we can infer. In, uh, in the Latin poet Ovid's great masterwork, The Metamorphosis, he, he talks about another man named Philemon, it's, it's a myth, and his wife Bacchus, who were granted the, the, the gift at their death by the gods because of their great generosity of one turning into an oak tree and the other into a linden tree that, that grew right next to each other and whose branches were completely intertwined together forever. Philemon is a, a Greek, a Gentile name. And so while the, the Philemon in front of us is, uh, is not that man, obviously, he's a real man, we know that he did not grow up either a Jew or a Christian. He did not know Jesus as his Savior. That was his life before Paul met him. But then Paul came along, and he introduced Philemon to Jesus, and he introduced Philemon to Moses and all the other Bible characters in between. That made all the difference in the world. It made him a different kind of man. Now, Philemon, it would also appear from what we see in the text, is a, a wealthy man. He was a slave owner, which would require a, a good deal of wealth. Uh, in the introductory passage of this letter, we, we learn also that he had a louse, house large enough that the, the, the church in his community actually met inside of his house. But that wealth was not what Philemon was known for. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Philemon was known for his godly acts of love. His life of kindness and generosity and goodness to the people around him was such that it even led to the re re refreshment. The, the, it touched the hearts of his fellow saints. Legend in his time, perhaps, was a little bit strong, but it, it was such a reputation that it, it expanded beyond this little congregation where he was. Now, even the Apostle Paul was feeling great joy and a personal sense of refreshment and encouragement because of Philemon's life. It was clear that Jesus was at work in Philemon's heart. And that is the basis for Paul's first Christian encouragement to do the right thing. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, 
I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I could just lay down the law, Paul says. I mean, after all, I'm a Christian apostle. I am this leader in the church. You are my spiritual son. I'm your father in the faith. I'm the one who brought you to faith. If I should simply give you the command, you should obey what I have to say on that basis alone. But that is not where Paul goes. I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. You're a changed man, Philemon. I know that because I see the grace of Jesus living inside of you. I, I see how that grace and forgiveness that you've latched onto has, has changed your life. You, you know how God has pardoned your pagan past and your imperfect present. You, you, you know how he will continue to forgive your faulty future in Jesus Christ. And that, that same grace that you have known is now a, a, a way of life, a, a, a grace and a love that you are extending to others by your kindness to them. Here is another place with uh, this person we're going to talk about in a moment. Here is another place for us to show it. Here is a proper Christian encouragement for you to do the right thing. Remember how you yourself have changed. Mary Poppins may be practically perfect in every way, but you know that that is not true of us, not even of us who believe. But we need God's grace. Faith does not come to us and suddenly eliminate every taste that you and I may have for something that is evil. If it appealed to us before we started to follow Jesus, it doesn't suddenly disappear. And though we may believers, it do, be believers, it doesn't mean that we aren't sometimes petty, that we may not throw ourselves a pity party because someone has offended us that we, we aren't still subject to, to, to getting angry with others even inside the faith. <laughs> to, to, to borrow a, a picture from Brennan Manning, it, it, it doesn't somehow spiritually numb us either as though we are a, a patient who's been etherized and lying on the, the operating table. But faith doesn't leave us untouched either. It, it, it doesn't come and deal with us and leave us unchanged. It opens our eyes to God's truth. It plants inside of our hearts a, a, a new, a competing set of desires. It makes the Holy Spirit to be connected to us in our lives and even to make our own bodies his residence, the place where he lives. It changes us in love. Uh, faith is a living thing, a living thing inside of every Christian that, that is like a tree that produces fruit, and the fruit in this case is the fruit of love. Jesus once said, you know, by their fruits you will know them. This is what he meant. In, in the movie The Lion King, you remember Mufasa, the ghost of Mufasa says to his son Simba, remember who you are. You are more than you have become. And, and Paul could say something similar to Philemon and say something similar to us, to us yet today, right? You have, remember you who you are. As you also see what God is leading you to become. Remember how you have changed. Changed in love. It's proper Christian encouragement to do the right thing. Now we come to the specific problem. There was this man named Onesimus. He had been a slave of Philemon. He didn't like to be a slave of Philemon. He ran away. 
He met Paul. Paul is sending him back. What's Philemon going to do? Onesimus left home an unbeliever. Now he's a believer. And, and so Paul also says, not only think Philemon about how you have changed, but we have to think also about how Onesimus, how others have changed as I encourage you to do the right thing. I, Paul, as an elderly man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, <clears throat> but now he's useful both to you and to me. I am sending him back to you. I am sending my very own heart. Onesimus ran away from Philemon's house in western Turkey. He found his way all the way to Rome where Paul was in prison a thousand, more than a thousand miles away. Now, whether Onesimus fled to Rome because he was somehow seeking Paul out, had met him when Paul first met Philemon, or, or whether he simply went to Rome because it was the big city and he hoped to kind of disappear there in the crowds where he, he might not be captured and sent home, that's more detail than we have. But, but one way or another, Paul and Philemon, I'm sorry, Paul and Onesimus met up again. And while Philemon had left, uh, Onesimus had left the home of Philemon, an unbeliever, now Paul is sending him back a believer. He's a brother in the faith. Like Philemon, this meant that Onesimus had changed. There's an interesting little play on words you, you don't get in the English translation here from Paul's uh, description of Onesimus. In, in the Greek, Onesimus means something like useful. It, it actually was not an uncommon nickname that a, a slave owner in ancient times in, in, in the, the Greek world would uh, apply to his slaves, useful. So Paul says when he was just your slave and, and not a Christian brother, he was kind of useless to you. Now Paul says he is useful. Jesus' love filled his heart, and, and that had turned Onesimus from merely a slave to a fellow believer, a, a person who sees his whole life as a service to others, just as it had done with Philemon. In fact, Onesimus' service was so dear to Paul himself uh, so useful that Paul calls him my very own heart. It even tempted him to keep Onesimus with him in Rome. I, I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. Onesimus was a changed man, both in heart and in life. The Bible teaches us to love and serve everybody. And if Onesimus had remained an unbeliever, the Apostle Paul could still have written to Philemon about uh, how to express love. But the fact that this is a brother in the faith, well, that adds even an extra component here, an extra reason in Christ to do the right thing. Remember how he had changed. Sometimes we see other members of the church as nothing more than kind of useless objects, maybe. Kind of like when you go to the theater and the other people who are occupying the other seats are they're just strangers there and mean very little one way or another. Sometimes, honestly, they even offend us. They say something that offends me. They, they get in the way of what I want to do in the church. They make me mad. And at such times, maybe we're tempted to think, you know, maybe I should just live my life as a Christian solo. Maybe I don't need them all, and I should just go off and, and do it by myself and ignore all of them. Paul's words to Philemon would urge us to open our eyes and to see things differently. 
You see, the, the, the love of God has changed both us and them. Those other people in the church, God's love has, has completely transformed our relationship with them. Yeah, yeah, sometimes they're a pain in the neck. Who isn't sometimes? But they share our faith. Like Onesimus, they are even useful to me, sometimes just by their very presence, not having us alone in this world in our faith. And so Paul urges us, see what they are, see how they've changed. Look a little harder. Christian love urges us to do the right thing as we also consider how they, others, have changed. In order to lay this on Philemon's heart a little bit more then, Paul takes him another step deeper so that he makes sure that Philemon can see the blessing in what has happened between him and Onesimus. He wants him to recognize the blessing of this situation. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but out of your own free will, for perhaps this is why he was separated you from a time, for a time, so that you might get him back permanently, no longer a slave, but more than a slave is a dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me, but how much more to you both in flesh and in the Lord." Forced obedience is no obedience at all. Paul could have just kept Onesimus with him there in Rome, and he, he would have made Paul's life easier while Paul was in prison. Maybe he would have even helped to uh, advance and promote the gospel mission he was trying to carry out. But the end justifies the means is not a Christian way of thinking. For Paul to do this, he would be doing it without Philemon's knowledge, without Philemon's content, consent, against or without, at least, Philemon's will. He, he would have been robbing also his friend uh, Philemon of the opportunity to grow in his love from what had happened. He, he, he would be preventing the opportunity for a reconciliation of these two men, a new and higher and better relationship between them. In our pursuit of good purposes, doing the wrong thing does not work. So Paul sends Onesimus back, but he makes sure that Philemon recognizes the blessing, the benefit. Blessing one, he was separated from you for a brief time. Yeah, yeah you, you lost him for a little while, his uh, labor, maybe for a few weeks or for a few months, but you get him back permanently. His time away from Philemon was Paul's time to bring Onesimus to faith. Philemon was going to have him in his life now, a, a, a genuine, wonderful connection to him that was going to not only go through the rest of life here on earth, but into all eternity. Blessing number two, Philemon gets Onesimus back no longer as a slave, but more than a slave as a dearly loved brother. He was not getting a piece of property. He was not even merely getting an employee. He was getting a Christian brother. Onesimus was now a family member. He was an equal. A piece of property may be a useful tool. An employee may help to get some work done. But a brother? A true brother? One in the faith? That's someone who's going to love you. That's someone who's going to serve you far beyond what anyone else might do, anyone forced under you, someone who will stand by you, who will defend you, someone who will be a partner with you. Philemon's treatment of Anesima shouldn't only be based on what's in it for me, but when we see the blessings that were involved here, certainly there was that aspect to this as well. He had every reason to let 
And as a Muscola, to recognize this new relationship when he recognized the blessings and then to do the right thing. The gospel leads Christians to serve one another. You know that. But we do so not as slaves. We do it as equals, as partners. We do it in love. This implies treating each other in a certain way as well as we also then learn to appreciate the blessings that come from it as God encourages us to do the right thing. Well, maybe Philemon still has to get over this idea that he's lost something, that he's giving something up. So Paul concludes here, with the last encouragement as he assures him, that is a Philemon, that he is not alone in living out the implications of Christian love. Consider your partners. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention that you owe me even your very self. We're on the same team, Paul is saying, you and, and me and Onesimus. We are all partners. Understand, my friend, that I am in there with you on this. I, I'm not just telling you to do something that's going to require a sacrifice while I'm not going to stand back and do anything at all. I, I have nothing to give up here. If Onesimus uh, owes you something because he took it with him when he left, I'll repay it. Repay it out of my own pocket. If, if you simply need to be paid back for the time and work that was lost, I will repay it, Paul says. I'm in here with you. I'm your partner. You're, you're not being asked to, to live this Christian life of love alone. And it's still true, right? God does not ask us to give up anything that he has not already given up for us himself. He does not ask us to do anything that he has not already done for us. And even more, he gave us his one and only son. We have the gospel. And still, he gives us Christian partners also. People like you and me who are living the same life. People who are like you and me making the same sacrifices, putting into practice the same love based on the gospel we have come to know. We are not alone when we are doing the right thing. So maybe as we come to the end here, it surprises us that at uh, no point in time does Paul actually just come right out and say it. He never says the words, set Onesimus free. <coughs> the closest he gets to that is this, since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But what is left beyond already claiming the man is his own brother in the faith. Paul had the confidence that faith and love would lead Philemon to come to the right conclusion and do the right thing. Let's still trust that faith and love are enough to move God's people to do the right thing today. Amen. Please stand.